Collective and the CEO of Hawaii Investment Ready. Donovan Kialoha is the director of Startup Capital Ventures and co-founder of Purple Maya. Ian Musson, he's the founder and program director of Kokiri Startup Accelerator. Kiana Frank, she's an assistant professor and researcher of Hawaiian ecosystems at the University of Hawaii. We have Herb Lee, executive director of the Pacific American Foundation. And we have Ryan Fitzalls, who's a digital artist, award-winning musician, and director producer of documentaries and works at Kamehameha School. So please help me to welcome our panel. So mahalo for joining us. I'm gonna ask that all of you answer this, this first question. How would you define indigenous innovation? So we'll start with you, Kiana. Hello, my talk co. So when I think of indigenous innovation, I think of um, transforming and creating things that are benefit societal well-being. And I'm not talking about just creating things that are brand new, because from an indigenous perspective, we grew up connected to our place, understanding relationships between people, place, akua, feelings. And so I think of indigenous innovation as really bringing something ancient uh, into the 21st century, transforming it and redefining it in a way that benefits our society, but aligns with all of our cultural values and, and understanding of the world. Um, yeah, building on that, I mean, it's, to me, it's when you break down the word indigenous, right? It's about being in a place. It's about being in a place for a long time. Um, so when you think about it from that perspective, for me, indigenous innovation, to build off what Kiana said, is, is about that deep connection to place and about enduring in place. So, you know, from an entrepreneurial perspective, understanding your place um, and observing your place. So we have a term in Hawaii called kilo. It's where you observe the, the, the systems, the things that are happening around you. I think we can take that um, into a 21st century context of kilo and look around um, what's happening around us. What are the patterns? What are, what are, what's changing? Uh, what are the influencers? Like, what's really going on? And then identifying problems and opportunities within those patterns of what you see because you've been there and you've observed. Um, and for entrepreneurs, uh, indigenous entrepreneurs, a lot of us think from that perspective. Like how do we provide an opportunity or solve a problem for our place, for our people, for our community, for our ecosystems? You know, it is about all the relationships. It's about our relationship to the broader ecosystem, not just to the financial markets or to the politics or, or those things. Like every living thing around us is part of our community, our ecosystem. Um, and so if we're looking generationally as, um, as indigenous people in, in, in place for a long time, and we need to survive for multiple generations and, and, and thrive for generations, then things that we are creating today are to provide for that outcome. Okay, I'll just pass the mic because I guess Kiana and Keone just covered everything that I was going to say. <laughs> but uh, just to echo what they're saying, yeah, the relationships, not only with people, um, but with place, which is super important. It's like our familial connections to this Aina, um, viewing it as something that you are in concert with and that you have this connection, not something you dominate or something that you own. Um, is super important, the relationship you have with time. So when you're thinking on a generational time scale, um, you plan and you do things with intentionality as they were talking about it on their lunch table earlier today. Um, you do things for a different reason. Um, I think uh, indigenous innovation is always leaning on the, the past, not because you're wallowing in the past or you're, you're trying to like, you know, stay in that space, but you're looking to it to inform you in making better decisions for the future. And our kapuna were brilliant in that way. Um, they left us uh, a legacy, they left us a treasure trove of ways of knowing, ways of being, uh, things to do so that we can follow that blueprint and we can continue on their path of being innovators. Aloha. I think of uh, one word, and that is uh, indigenous innovation equals uh, survival. So really short story, um, I've been involved in the restoration of a 400 year old ancient Hawaiian fish pond for the last 25 years. When we started, we didn't have any manual. 
on how to restore the pond. <clears throat> but we, over the last 25 years, I, I feel like we have begun to rediscover uh, the, the mana'o, the, the ideas and the thoughts that went into three things. And this transcends time, I think. The first thing is uh, powers of observation over a long period of time. And in taking those powers of observation, as Keone said, kilo. And then being able to be able to interpret what you see. And then take that interpretation and be able to apply it in a way that <clears throat> contributes to how one survives. So the pond is 400 years old. How did they actually do this? How did they go from being a hunter and gatherer and going out into the open ocean to actually being able to uh, <clears throat> manipulate the landscape to be able to now grow food in these ancient Hawaiian ponds. It was an incredible feat. And so we fast forward to the 21st century. Those three skills are probably even more prevalent and more important than ever because indigenous innovation is still about survival in the 21st century. <clears throat> Look at Hokulea. Hokulea was never built to go around the world. It went just in the Pacific. But they had the courage and they had the the tools, what I call the, the OIA principle, observation, interpretation, application, to be able to take that collective wisdom to innovate and go around the world. And using both um, indigenous wisdom and knowledge as well as contemporary science and technology and, and new knowledge and be able to bridge and combine that in ways that now we can take that and solve problems. And uh, you know, for us as uh, uh, Native Hawaiians in this place, you know, that is our foundation, that is that is our indigenous lens that we look at. And so I see it simply as continuing to how we looked at, how we survived in the past and how we can continue to survive with those powers into the future. Kia ora. I'm the moment of Pani Eksin, okay, so I'm from outside the world. When I think of, and Indigenous innovation, the one way that I put to it to, to kind of build off what Herbert said is success. And what I mean by that is redefining what success means for Indigenous business. So back home, we we build a program that supports Indigenous based startups, Maori based startups. And the idea, the first thing, first point of call that we looked at was how do we redefine what the idea or the concept of success looks like? Because oftentimes you find in a from a Western concept, it's about scaling something, building something, making a lot of cash, which is cool, that's fine. From our perspective, and no doubt from the perspective of a lot of Native Hawaiians, the idea is about how can we build something more meaningful? How can we build something that creates employment opportunity, intergenerational success and the like? Um, so that's, I guess, my, my few cents and how I look at what Indigenous innovation is. So I think of the word opportunity. I, as a venture capitalist, I split my time between here and the Bay Area, so I get to see you know, the kinds of really cool things that are happening in Manoa Valley as well as Silicon Valley. And you know, I, I just think there's a lot of opportunity for us as innovators and to have a history of innovation to put ourselves at the intersection of culture and technology and leverage the, the modern tools to put our fully on to support to allow our our lands and our people to prosper. And so, um, you know, as an investor, you, know, you get to see a lot of different deal flow. And you know, just touched upon earlier today about the diversity of entrepreneurs and also of funders. And you know, if you kind of look at a lot of the companies and who's founded them, they kind of look a certain way. And so, I think you know, there's an opportunity for more place-based indigenous innovators, whether they be from Aotearoa, Alaska, Arizona, or wherever First Nations be have the fluency to both navigate the modern world but be grounded in their indigenous culture to de develop solutions that have global application. And in that sense, we can then monetize as opposed to monetize opportunities that bring abundance and prosperity to all. Mahalo. Dominique, can you um, we'll, we'll keep the mic with you for a little bit. Can you expand on the meaning of monetize? M-A-N-A, -N -A, monetize. Um, Buddy Kiola in front is probably a perfect example of monetizing, right? It's this idea that this, this power, right? This inherent divine spiritual power that comes from Apua, the, the, our gods, the places, right? And that's in you within us, and we cultivate that. We use 
develop that by being of service to others, by perpetuating the stories of this place, right, that, that carry the values of how we treat each other. And so by being a channel, a vessel for those kinds of things and expressing them through our caps, through our clothing, through the way that we interact with each other in business, our stakeholders, our customers, that's um, sort of what I say when I say monetize. So it's really a worldview, right, um, a way of approaching um, this kupuna wisdom, if you will, right? Um, you folks talked about creating those connections and seeing the patterns and, and being able to um, almost create sort of this constellation of, of bright, bright spots. Uh, and can you tell us how has um, culture, how has that shaped, um, informed, influenced the work that you do with your accelerator? Yeah, so, so to keep it up, I'll make it a real short story. So. The reason we came to being a belt was back home, they have had accelerator programs that support entrepreneurs for the last decade or so. There's always been a real limited engagement by Maori Pacific and Pekingism. And so the challenge that we faced was identifying why there was that gap. Because we know, we had a discussion all day, um, we could talk basically all, all day, all night around how our family, how our people, how our ancestors were innovators, are innovators. And so we thought, you know, there's a bit of a problem there that We've got this history of entrepreneurship, yet our people aren't willing to engage in these types of programs. Now, what we came to effectively, and as a long story short, was that that concept of what does success look like from a business perspective? You know, is it about scaling something and making one person you know, millions and millions of dollars, which is no problem with, or is it about intergenerational wealth, communal wealth, building job opportunities for our climate? What we looked to do from there was, okay, we've got a problem, we understand how we may be able to overcome that. There's so-called best practice in the world around what to do to support a startup. And so from our perspective, it was to disassemble that and you know, look at it, but pull it apart, and then start from a foundation based on values, based on values that are representative in our culture, starting with those, building on those, and then adding on those components that support the delivery of, of startups effectively. So grounded in culture, grounded in values, grounded in something that's meaningful, Tony, can you talk a little bit about Wi-Fi and how culture helps to shape that social enterprise for profit? Uh, yeah, so we co-founded a space called Wi-Fi Collective uh, in right outside near, near the university in urban Honolulu. Uh, uh, me and a couple of uh, friends, um, we we're, were tasked with uh, kind of thinking about how to strengthen the social cohesion um, and the systems live in um, to try and experiment around that and um, where that comes from I think is from a Hawaiian from an indigenous worldview uh, like we mentioned earlier we, we think collectively we think long term uh, we think generatively when you put that up against the Western capitalist uh, worldview uh, there's tension because the other system is individualistic it's transactional not relational generations and so that rub that exists between the dominant system that we all live in we like to call it the operating system so the operating system of our society that's the program right it's designed around like the core incentive is profit maximization at all costs um, and we see the results of that you know um, and for us I think uh, from an indigenous worldview and a Hawaiian worldview when that rub exists when we start to see patterns, we see the worldview differences, we see the behavior differences, um, you know, it doesn't feel good. And so how can we start to um, be more intentional about talking about the, our value set? Like one of the common things that when we were answering that first question, it's, it's about intentionality, right? And so, you know, this conference, you know, a lot of people who are in here, you know, some Hawaiian, some not, um, some from away, and some not from Hawaii. What does this have to do with you, right? Um, so that we're not having an us and them conversation. Uh, our cultures are very inclusive. Um, we're about collective. Aloha is something that resonates with people when they come here um, because it feels good, how we treat each other. So there is potential for that, you know? So when we talk about indigenous innovation, I think that it, it, it brings everybody into the conversation if you understand that everybody is indigenous to some place. Everybody is indigenous to this planet, and every, 
but is indigenous is somewhere down your boundary line. And it, again, it's about that. It's being in place, it's about thinking long term, it's about thinking about your relationship to others. Um, so, you know, when, like with Baiwai, what we wanted to do was kind of be intentional to talk about that, to have these conversations, to say, hey, the way things are going kind of doesn't feel good to me. And rather than uh, having a sense of inevitability to that, proactive and starting to talk about, okay, how, what are our values, who do we want to be, who do we think we are, and how can we put that into practice, into daily life. So Ryan, tell us a little bit about your work. So you're, you're in technology, you're developing media. How is culture defining um, the work that you're doing? Well, I think, um, I, well, so I work for Kamehameha Schools, and I, I realized as I was sitting here and I'm looking up there earlier that we're a title sponsor, so I'm now I realize why I'm sitting here in the seat in the middle of the stage. Not sure. It's very, very talented. Um, but uh, you know, I work for a department called Kelly Nikomo, and what we do is we support this large network. Again, there's this collective body of folks in Hawaiian education out in the community called Kanao Kana, um, and they span across the pipeline. And we have some on the continental U.S. Really, what they're really interested in and what they're aiming for is to grow the next generations with an S of Aloha and the leaders. And so you know how we're talking about earlier, we're thinking generationally, we're thinking about relationships, not only to people, but to place, because that's super important. And as Kelly was mentioning, we're all indigenous somewhere. Um, and the, the things that we, we do, whether that's our media or our tech or the projects that we work on, have that kind of frame around it. And again, when we think about it in that framework, um, so a lot of our decisions are, are made with that long view mind. Um, I wanted to kind of just dovetail off of what Ian and Keone were talking about. Um, Ian mentioned what success looks like and defining that, and what Keone does at Bye Bye. For those of you that don't know, Bye Bye is like, in Hawaiian, that's like, it, it translates to wealth, right? And what I love about going to Bye Bye, because I've gone there on many occasions because it's a awesome space, is how they're defining what wealth is, again, creating relationships. You see all kinds of people from different sex, sexts, Okay, that doesn't sound good on the mic. <laughs> different areas of our community who have different things to offer, and they're just giving, it's, just, it's like, they're giving more of themselves than they're receiving, and they're defining wealth for what it means in this community, and I think they're doing a really good job of what that, that what Hawaiian, living, being Hawaiian today in an urban space looks like. And uh, I already see some of the echoes and the ripples coming out of that, and, and I'm hoping that more of those types of spaces are gonna be kind of popping up in, in different places, because there's a lot of, it's, it's about connecting people and it's about relationships, so, um, yeah. Kiana, can you talk a little bit about the research that you're doing around a Hawaiian ecosystem and how is culture helping to shape, shape your research? So I'm a scientist, and a lot of people might think that science and culture don't go together, but for me, the practice of science speaks to the core of how I identify as a Hawaiian and how I perpetuate the practices of my kupuna because our, our aina and our relationships with our aina and our understanding of our aina and our perpetuation and sustainability of our aina is really a huge innovation that our people had. And I want to um, spin off of what Uncle Herb said, and he's talking about indigenous innovation as survival. But I want to take it a step further and talk about indigenous innovation as thriving because our ecosystems were thriving. And they were thriving with the people that lived in them in these coupled socio-ecological systems. And so for me, science is how I understand the places that I come from. It's how I connect to my kupuna, and it's how I can maintain um, the sustainability and resilience of these places for my whole kupuna, for, for my ancestors. And so I, I study the environment. Uh, I study microbes in the environment, the things that you can't see. So not only am I a scientist, like, whoa, uh, I'm a microbiologist, so I study things that you can't see, so think of the challenges of like trying to get people excited about microbes. Um, and, and even though microbes didn't come in the, the global world until the microscope was invented in the 16th century, and, and Antoine Lund looked under a lens and saw these wee beasties, our kupuna observed them, and they understood them, and they could feel the mana of microbes, and they arranged all of their management practices from Malka to Makai to benefit these microbial processes. And they wrote about them and they sang about them in our stories. And so a lot of my research is using these contemporary tools um, like technology and sequencing innovations and, 
and probes and all sorts of gidgets and gasmos that you throw in the environment to measure things, to, to decode all of the information that our kupuna left for us to understand, all of those connections. Because our kupuna, in the sixth line of our clone people, our, our genealogy origin chant, it says, um, from the source in the slime, the earth formed. The sixth line of our Kumu people that's orienting our, ourselves in the universe, in time, and space, is talking about how these unseen elements, these microbial elements, created our world. And so I'm trying to use contemporary tools to better understand that and deepen that ikei, deepen that knowledge so that we can maintain that connection to our spaces and, and maintain our, um, our strength and our uh, ownership over the realm of science. Because I am Hawaiian and I am a scientist and I'm really proud of that. And, and I get really excited to be in these spaces with all these other indigenous innovators because we're currently innovating the way that we practice science, the way that we do science, the way that we integrate across culture and technology. And um, you know, we're talking about wealth. And really, if you're going to understand why, why, right? You're, it's because you have pihina to the place that you're in. You're understanding that space. And really, I think it's a time where we, we need to start transforming the conversation about wealth to why, why. From talking about kala, currency, to kala, right? To fish, to a certain type of yummy, delicious fish. Um, and so that's, that's the way I, I frame my whole kind of scientific it's about working with communities to recreate and sustain thriving ecosystems. So all of you I would consider amazing innovators. And you're all pretty young, which is, which is awesome. But I, I'd like Donovan and her to talk about how you're cultivating the next generation of young innovators through the work that you're doing with Purple Maina and what you're doing over at the fish pond. Okay, um, I'm really inspired by what Kiana just said because Kiana is living proof. I, I'm gonna be 65 this year and I just love hearing what she says because she is part of our succession. Um, so, and, and mahalo for all that you contribute, Kiana. Um, you know, when I was growing up, I thought the world was infinite. In Hawaii, <clears throat> We live in the middle of the Pacific, the most isolated landmass on the planet. And our ancestors knew how to survive living with finite resources. So isn't it ironic that today, that we live in a global society and that now we realize, and this is not my terms, I think, and I don't know if it was my Noah's term, but the, the planet now realizes that it too is an island that we have finite resources and we have basically screwed it up. So a lot of the world is turning back to the indigenous ways. And so how does that relate to succession? And I, I'm thinking that, again, uh, living, on, living with finite resources, and I want to go a little bit deeper on the word five life. Because in the days of old, okay, and even now, the word vai means fresh water in Hawaii. We only have 1% of it on the entire planet. In the days of old, meaning before Western contact, whoever controlled the fresh water in the islands, the finite resources, was considered rich by Western standards today. So when we redouble that, that term, we say vai vai, that means you're really rich. And from a Western perspective, we think about, you know, money, kala. But vai vai, in the, you know, the, the chiefs probably would be the only ones that had vai vai because they would control more of the water. So you see there's a, there's a different perspective and it, it evolves and changes. My point is that as in, in my experience in, in working with the pond, how we've been able to try to allow the opportunity for children to remember, for us to remember, uh, um, 
the wisdom of our ancestors is really important. Uh, so, restoration of the pond for us, <clears throat> really, if we are looking to sustain it for another 400 years, and I think it's really important because these ponds, even though they were designed to grow fish, not one of us in all of the eight major Hawaiian islands have been able to do that like our ancestors did. Not one of us have been able to grow fish in what we now call a commercial or market economy. Why? Because the environmental conditions have drastically changed. So we're looking now to recapture, to figure out, to innovate, to figure out what is a new formula for us to grow seaweed that can feed the fish, that can feed you know, the whole ecosystem. So for me, restoration and education equals long-term sustainability. Because this work is not, no one of us can do. So the succession and how we've incorporated the culture is to help kids reconnect to place and to understand that they have a responsibility or in Hawaii we say a kuleana, to be able to take that knowledge. And as we're learning it together in the restoration of some of these very important places, to be able to apply the knowledge in creative ways and bridging both the old wisdom as well as the contemporary knowledge, the science and technology. We have sensors, we have drones, we use it all now as part of our stewardship and restoration of the pond. We incorporate it all. And for us, <clears throat> we, we have now been able to develop a whole slew of what, what we have called culture-based rigorous education that can teach science, mathematics, social studies, language arts, in the context of these places, to be able to, for these children to understand that the application, the observation, the application, the interpretation of knowledge is now their kuleana. And that's how we create succession, so that, you know, hopefully, maybe not in my generation, we can be able to grow food for people again, because again, we still live in the same place, finite resources. Purple uh, Mike, we're an EdTech uh, nonprofit organization. We uh, design and deliver uh, what we call indigenized technology curriculum um, at the middle school, high school, and dabbling at the post secondary level. Uh, and our mission is to transform, or empower, and educate the next generation of problem solvers and technology makers. We've been around for about four years. We're on all of the major Hawaiian islands. Um, one of our students is actually here in the audience doing some incredible things. You know, we're a startup in the sense that we're still trying to figure out these kinds of things, right? How do we ground our coding and computer science is like really difficult, right? So how can we empower our kids to just stick with it so we can tell stories about their ancestors being innovators and big thinking and you know audacious thinking and that's sort of the program that we've developed but as we were you know a couple of years ago we we're thinking like well you know what are we doing are we teaching these kids to have these skills so they can fly off to silicon valley and you know kind of contribute to the diaspora and that's when we thought about trying to do something you know try to run an experiment if you will um prototype an idea and that's where the idea for purple prize came about so it's our attempt to create or blaze a pathway or incubate some ideas that allow for our kids who are coming up through our programs to see themselves or to see the kinds of models of companies, enterprises that are leveraging technology to uh, do things that confirm their identity. And so well, we've got our kickoff day that's happening tomorrow. We've done this for about two years. We've given away about $100,000 in prizes, a number of projects have now evolved to become companies. Um, whether they be high growth, that's still a big question, but that's, that's okay. You know? companies are kind of doing some really cool things including um, Kiana's project came through two years ago they're continuing with some interesting things um, and tell us what in your view what competitive advantage does an indigenous worldview provide to the marketplace uh, this approach answering that is oftentimes we talk about tech in this space now I see tech as and we've got one of our founders from our last program in the audience, we'll shout him out, Arataki, because he's right in the middle with a cap on. Um, you're looking at him, he's smiling. Um, and 
what leads us lead to mysticism? What we talk about, what's kind of different in this space is tech is just the enabler. We need to start with the tech. You know, it starts with the story. You know, we, we constantly talk about and you hear people talk about you know, you start with why, which is cool, but it's something we've known for for forever. We start with what is important to us and then we use tools to take it to the world. And the reason I bring Lee up in particular is what he does, it's a, it's a piece of tech called Arataki Cultural Trails. But what it starts from is sharing stories of cultural significance and taking people to places they may have never been to. And we always talk about it, Lee always, and he's the first one to always say is that the tech is just the enabler. Whereas, you know, what they do is all about story based and purpose based. It's about why. Um, but I also think about the other teams that we work with, other startups that we work with, is there's always a it's a transitional part of the business, but it's always trying to serve something far greater than themselves. It's, you know, nowadays we call it social enterprise, but again, that's a, that's a title we've tagged onto something that we've done for forever. You know, we, we work with supporting something greater than ourselves to achieve something far beyond what we could do by ourselves and far beyond what's solely going to serve us. It's about coming back to that whole concept of communal wealth, communal well-being, building something that supports others. And, like one of them was saying, you know, some of these things, they may be highly scalable, they may not be, but at the end of the day, it's going to be better. It's about what it's going to do well, because the way I look at what success is in some point is contextual. Um, you know, in certain situations, success looks like X, and other situations, looks like Y. Um, the example of have used we talked about this in Aotearoa is a community called Kawaru, for example. So it's, it's in the middle of, of the North Island. There's a high dependency on government support, there's a, a massive gang influence. There's, you know, you'll be, you'll find it quite hard to find families where there are two parent homes and there's a highly populated by Māori in that space. Now, success in that environment, if you can have a business that goes in there and has the opportunity to create 10 jobs, that transforms that community. Because you look at it in the fact that now, mum or dad, there's 10 people with a brand new job working full time. There might be 20 or 30 kids and they have this example of mum or dad going to work constantly, yada, yada, yada. And you've got that next generation of people who have seen something successful happen in their family as opposed to be reliant on the status quo they've always been exposed to. Um, what we've always tried to focus on too with Kōkiri is the idea of how you can build success where you are. We're so effectively not, and this goes with Donovan's is, is quarter as well, around, you know, we're not building people so they go to Silicon Valley. We can showcase that you can build success wherever you are in the world effectively. You know, there's, the last thing we want to do when we're running programs back in Aotearoa is make people have to move to the bigger cities on the premise that that's where they have to go to make success because you get kids come through, they come through high school, university, and there's always that notion of, I'm going to go away, I'm going to study, learn some great things, and I'm going to come home. But we see the bright lights, and you don't really come back home. So we want to showcase that you can actually do that and achieve those measures of success where you are. Um, you don't have to leave like, wherever it is you brought home. And then Ryan, can you talk a little bit about what you see the competitive advantage being in integrating culture and this indigenous perspective? And where's the appetite? Where are we seeing it globally? Or even um, locally? Um, yeah, I think the biggest thing, biggest things for competitive advantage is authenticity and purpose. Um, it, like intentionality, right? Um, who we are is who we are. We wear it, we live it, we practice it all the time. And the things that we bring forth with that, um, with who we are, you know, they're enduring. They're deep, we deepen relationships, we build trust, we think about the long term. Um, and that kind of authenticity and purpose to what we do, I think resonates a lot. And, and, and it's gonna resonate more with the, num the generations that are coming because they're, they're being born into a world of problems that they didn't create, but they see the problems. You know, they're not trying to mask it under like, well, it's just an unfortunate byproduct of what we had to do. Right? They're not seeing it that way. They're like, no, I can't afford to live here anymore. Like, what's going on? Um, so the, the, you know, Silicon Valley is great, creates a lot of innovation, but there's no authenticity there. You know, it's, it, it's always changing, right? And it's the next hottest, newest thing. And I think for, for us, you know, in Hawaii and, you know, indigenous cultures, like, we're, we are who we are. We're grounded in the past as our guide to the future. 
future, right? And you know, that level of authenticity and that level of purpose, I think, really, really, really what sets us apart. And also, like what Keanu, Keanu was talking about, you know, like you look at Hawaiians and for us specifically, and what we are unlocking now um, through our ancestral knowledge because more people are learning our language. Um, so for those of you who don't know, like Hawaiian language was the language of instruction. It was a language of these islands until 1896 when it was banned in public schools and English became kind of the, the dominant. Um, but our ancestors were prolific in documenting um, their thoughts and their practices and their stories in the Hawaiian language newspapers starting from the 1830s to the 1890s. Um, but because of that language loss over the last hundred years, not very many Hawaiians speak Hawaiian. But now there are more because of uh, the Hawaiian Renaissance and such. So the knowledge that is being unlocked on a daily basis because we now understand our language and speak our language again, um, that cultural IP is a huge competitive advantage, especially when you think about sustainability and resiliency marketplace, that IP is invaluable. Yeah, I mean, I love that Kiana referenced the sixth line of the Kumulipa, which goes back thousands and thousands of years. And it's referencing stuff that, you know, in some cases, modern science is now, oh, okay, I see what you're talking about. And our component didn't have, they, what they had available to them at that time was their technology, right? We have all these other technologies that are available to us. And as Kiana saying, the IP that exists back from our pupuna is invaluable and talking about an enormous competitive advantage and I don't like to use the word competitive when I think about our culture, I, I think of it like it's collective and community. The, the advantage is that we build better communities, the advantage is that we build stuff for the right reasons and we build things that last um, for survival and for thriving. Um, I think, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I'll keep it short and sweet because, you know, much more brilliant people around here, but yeah, that's my answer. Yeah. As an investor, how how are you seeing sort of this global landscape in terms of the appetite for businesses, products, services that incorporate culture? I guess I'm seeing more diversity focused venture funds, diversity focused accelerators, um, you know, people of color sort of emerging and sort of trying to uh, bring different kinds of solutions from their perspective, which is interesting. Um, for a firm like ours, we're a little bit more on the traditional side, right? So we focus, sorry, as our capital ventures, we focus primarily on B2B technology companies. But that said, it's interesting because my latest deal was into a company that is building software to enable biotech companies to be more um, efficient. Um, it was a hot deal, we were able to get in. Um, it was because of the connection that I was able to develop with the entrepreneur who sort of happens to Puerto Rican, right? The two only brown guys at this conference. Like, hey, bada, hey, bada. He's like talking stories, like developing a relationship. It turns out he's building a great company. Um, but again, the level of authenticity and the focus on relationships first allow our firm to sort of eat up some other firms to get into this deal that's doing well right now. So, um, you know, I guess in terms of appetite, you know, there are a number of social impact investors that are popping up. There are a number of hybrid venture funds that are recognizing that high growth as jet fuel may be different, you know, there, there needs to be a different kind of solution. So it's interesting to see different kinds of opportunities for companies coming up, you know, being started by people different than who normally gets funded. So it's kind of an exciting time, interesting time. I think a time for us as an indigenous community to step forward and sort of assert ourselves to be at the table. Because if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, as commonly knows. <laughs> Ian, can you give us an example from your accelerator where culture has really been sort of that selling point for either scaling of a company or seeding, um, getting funding? Any examples? Yeah, I'll, I'll refer back to the man in front of me. Um, so you guys can all look at him and make him feel, well, probably feel great to be fair. Um, so to give you an idea of what Lee does, so, and this will help answer the question, I promise you. Um, about 10 years ago, he helped found uh, Storytelling Collective. And it was about the idea of you know, going around and sharing stories, and I use the word sharing intentionally, um, sharing stories that every or tribe only across, across the country. Now, the idea with that is it allowed them to 
share stories that may otherwise become lost as the older generations start to pass on. Now, Lee can see quite quickly that, you know, that's from a model that's inefficient to be able to scale. It requires someone with an intrinsic knowledge to go around and share these stories. With a passion for engaging tech, the idea is what Lee has done now is look at utilizing an app-based platform, and he'll do a far greater deal of explaining to me to you guys than I can. So Graham and Mark is a making feel great about it. So he come from Aotearoa, so he's come a long way to be here. Um, utilizing a piece of technology to allow us all to visit sites of cultural significance, to unlock and be in the presence of our Maunga and Awa, our Mountain and River, and understand the stories that brought them to where they are. So and it's about sharing the stories that are beyond what we learn about and hear about in school. So we all hear about Marvel and the great amazing Cheetah. But there's other, many, many of our people who have done amazing things that we sometimes don't hear about. And so what Lee's platform allows us to do, or allows him to do, is actually share those and have people embrace them and engage them. And there's, telling you about it is, how to do it justice. It's one of those things that when you are immersed in it, it's transformational. So, and what he does now, and for, for Lee in that space is, you know, the goal isn't to scale this to a point to make millions and millions of dollars. The goal is to scale it to a point to share millions and millions of stories. The stories that will otherwise be lost. And the idea that which goes beyond that is, he does is does it extremely well in Aotearoa, and the opportunity now exists for him to share his platform, you know, and I, I use the word his platform particularly uh, intently, is because he understands that other cultures have stories to share. It's not his job to share those stories. It's his job to support people so they can tell their stories so they don't become lost or potentially lost in the future. So the idea around scaling is sometimes it does differ in how we actually view that concept of scale. So yes, for money, other times to ensure something does grow and has a greater impact across the world. Can, can you expand a little bit on that too from HIR, from Hawaii Investment Rate maybe? Can you read examples, companies that have come through the accelerator that have sort of this multiple return Model, that it's not just about profit. Um, yeah, so Hawaii Investment Ready is a Hawaiian social enterprise accelerator with them, right? Obviously, we're just like cousins with these guys, I guess. And it's great to meet him at this conference. Um, I think a great example is the Pot Organic Farm. So uh, they are the, the largest organic farm on the island, um, but they're also a social enterprise uh, where they're taking youth from one of the most challenged and most vulnerable communities uh, on the island, high native Hawaiian percentage, um, and providing them uh, college tuition, uh, stipends for working on the farm, and leadership development. Um, and what it's doing is uh, flipping the model. It's, it's looking at ways to be successful and bring in revenue um, to create systemic change for local food production, but also at the same time creating a labor force and a, and a leadership force from the community that would not otherwise not have these kinds of opportunities. So when you think about it from a cultural perspective, they're thinking systemically. They're thinking from a real high view about how all these parts are interrelated. Um, and again, that comes from observation, right? They know their community, they know what's happened in their community, they see the problems, and they've created a very integrated and holistic solution to solve it that meets contemporary market. So we have two minutes left, so I'm gonna ask every panelist to answer this last question, but in like 30 seconds. So where are you seeing the, the largest area of growth and promise for an indigenous worldview to be integrated into um, innovation and entrepreneurship, either here in Hawaii or globally? I think the work that Kiana is doing right now is incredibly important. I mean, I'm all about it, but she's just, her group, research group in the university is awarded with 10 something, $10 million. Dollars federal grants to do some incredible research. What's interesting is because I'm starting to see more deals in Silicon Valley uh, elsewhere for you know folks that are doing kind of similar things or making applications or just those kinds of things based off of the research that you're doing. So for me, I think it's really exciting from a basic research sort of application that she's doing. So I, I believe we have the opportunity as indigenous peoples to, to lead the way of thinking in the future. We had the opportunity to send a bunch of the founders we worked with to, to Vietnam. So from Aotearoa, it's a much, much bigger economy. And the idea 
this was the part of the purpose behind that was to help Alpine to see the size and scale of a country like that. And then, so we can't compete with that scale back home. But what we can compete with is the thought leadership in that space. And so the encouragement is we've got something special that is founded and grounded in us through generations and generations of ancestors that no one else can duplicate. It sits with us. So how can we leave the thought leadership? Uh, I want to put a challenge out to everybody. I think um, I understand competitive advantage. I want to generate revenues as well. But my challenge is to, to you, looking at it from a cultural standpoint, is is to try is is to ask the question to what end? Why <clears throat> why do we want to generate revenues? My challenge is look for opportunities where we can get a triple bottom. That means that we can earn revenues, we can give back something to the communities in which we live, and we can empower the next generation through education all simultaneously. I think we can, because our elders have taught us to think seven generations, and I never really understood that until I was actually, you know, until I actually acquired the fish pot, and now I had a kuleana to make, figure out how I can maintain this for 400 years. Your, your decision-making process totally changes. And you have to look at long-term sustainability way beyond your lifetime. <clears throat> and I think we have the power uh, in this room and the intellect in this room and the, and the dollars to be able to move it in the right direction, not only for us, but for us collectively as a global society. I think in terms of um, opportunities for innovation, Thing. You know, I work in an education space, so every day I'm seeing, um, you know, what it looks like when students are reared in Aina language and culture and they're really rooted. You come up with students that are well more connected to place and people. So I think what's really exciting about that space is uh, the the education and the type of edu the type of education that they're getting in these schools has the impact to change the educational system, which is outdated, right? Because we've been training these kids to be like. It's almost like an English industrial kind of rote memorization drill to kill. Um, but the stuff that's happening in Hawaiian culture-based schools um, has the potential to not only impact Hawaii, but impact the world in terms of education. Um, I think to answer the question, I have to kind of define like what opportunity is um, from my perspective. Because if opportunity for success is 10x, 100x scale globally, and you know that, is, and, and, and just revenue. Then you know I don't see any opportunity because that just doesn't align with who we are and how we think. Um, so if you think of success as or scale as um, being successful in place and getting back to local resiliency, um, then I think that's the biggest opportunity because for humankind as the indigenous people of planet Earth, for us to survive as humanity. The pressures that global capitalism and extractive capitalism can put on the planet, um, the only return for us to survive is local resiliency. And that gives us an opportunity for, as indigenous peoples from wherever those localities are, to, to create systems of resilience and sustainability. I want to cockle what everybody said, and I want to just kind of end with this idea that we're not always, everywhere in the world, not everybody is connected to their place. And indigenous perspectives are really societies, indigenous societies are poised to steward the rest of the world in a direction to really understand where they come from and connect. And I want to say, move from survival to thriving to better understanding aloha and the love, right? That that connection that you have that, that you have so deep it really defines how how you can even understand how to love. And I think that. That is what an indigenous perspective adds. It adds this layer that's not tangible, that's expressed through spirituality and emotion and song and dance. And, and we, as indigenous peoples from across the Pacific, um, we have so much to offer in that depth of understanding where we come from. And if everybody understood and loved their Aina in the way that indigenous people love Aina, Hello for spending this time with us and sharing your phenomenal.